Good evening, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of the rest of our team and our friends at LA Bay Book Company, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation of Tom Hartman. Good evening. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we are so glad that you're back with us as we start another season at Town Hall, our 22nd. This will be a season unlike any other, featuring in-person events, virtual events, and what we're calling hybrid events, which are, well, you can probably guess what that means. We're also continuing our scaled up podcast in the moment, which features exclusive interviews of authors, artists, and newsmakers by Denny Palmer, Steve Scher, and other local correspondents. They're released on Mondays and feature all new content. So we note them in the calendar, just like regular events. Meanwhile, many of our past talks, including several others with Mr. Hartman, are available in our video or podcast, I should say in video or podcast form in our digital media library. So many ways to engage with Town Hall. Tonight's presentation will run around 60 minutes, including Q&A. To integrate our in-person and virtual audience experiences, we've changed the Q&A platform for our events. So to submit your question, please enter meet.ps forward slash TH Hartman or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. Uh, we'll drop this link in the chat and remind, remind you all again uh, in the audience later on when we get to the Q&A uh, about how you do this. Um, but at any rate, uh, we'll all get the hang of it soon enough. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible and you can help us by keeping your own question concise. For those of you who wanna view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. As always, Town Hall's adding new events every day. Upcoming events include a look at quarantines, past and all too present, with authors Nicola Twilley and Jeff Maynard, who in my opinion is one of the most interesting authors we regularly host. Uh, stories of avian life with Birdpedia author Christopher Leahy, a discussion of systemic racism with CNN commentator Keith Boykin, and a celebration of 30 years of savage love with the irrepressible Mr. Savage himself. That last event is live in the building and you won't wanna miss that. Check our website or subscribe to our e-newsletter to get the latest updates as more programs are added, like I say, constantly. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civics programs are supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, the Norcliffe Foundation, the Nessholm Family Foundation, the Caffin Foundation, and the Wingoat Foundation Northwest. But finally, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching. If you share in Town Hall's vision of a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture uh, where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us tonight by donating or by becoming a member yourself. Last thing before we turn it over, I know you will want to dive deeper into the issues Tom's raising tonight by purchasing a copy of The Hidden History of Healthcare. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Elliott Bay Books. It's the fastest and um, most community supportive way you can possibly connect yourself to Tom's ideas. So please pick up a copy of the book through Elliott Bay. And with that, 
Tom Hartman is an award-winning author, radio host, teacher, and psychotherapist. I don't know if he won awards for his psychotherapy, but all the other stuff was certainly has certainly been award-winning. He's written 31 books in all, but my admittedly imperfect count, and six books so far as part of a series of hidden histories covering and uncovering crucial and controversial subjects and in institutions in the U.S., like the Supreme Court, gun control, and healthcare, monopolies, etc. His latest hidden history installment is the hidden history of American healthcare, why sickness bankrupts you and makes others insanely rich. And it's the subject of this evening's talk, so I hope, hope that's why you're here. Tom's a town hall veteran making multiple appearances over the years, but he's an absolute MVP of our virtual COVID era programs. This is his third appearance since the start of the pandemic. Next time, let it please be live. In the meantime, join me in welcoming Tom Hartman. Thank you, Ware. Thank you very much. And, and, uh, and, and thanks to Adele and Sean and Josh and Olivia and the Elliott Bay Book Company and, and to Town Hall Seattle. I mean, I really appreciate your inviting me here. And uh, it's a wonderful venue. And, and, and thank you to you who are, to, who are watching. Thank you for showing up for this. Um, I wanted to go through some of the things that I learned when I was uh, writing this book. Uh, the research is, for me, more than two thirds of the fun of writing a book. And, uh, you know, I learned an awful lot. And, the, and there's, there are dimensions to this that I think most Americans are, are completely unaware of, uh, in particular, the, the, the history of why of all of the developed nations on Earth, uh, for example, the 34 uh, OECD countries, the, 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 the 34 richest countries, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, only one has a patchwork quilt for-profit health insurance based um, uh, healthcare system, and that's us. Only one does not define health care where the access to health care is a human right, but rather as a privilege, and that's us. Only one defines healthcare as essentially not only a privilege, but a privilege um, whose principal purpose is to make a profit for somebody, and that's us. Uh, we're a real outlier in that regard, and the and we spend an extraordinary amount of money getting there. Um, we spend almost twice as much on healthcare as pretty much any other developed country in the world. Switzerland is is uh, the second most expensive. They're also the only one of those countries that doesn't really have a single payer or socialized system. Um, and so they're, they're very much an outlier. In Switzerland, everybody's required to have health insurance, but all the health insurance companies are required to be nonprofits and the government pays your, your, um, you know, your monthly uh, fee or your uh, membership or whatever um, if you can't afford to. So it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward stuff there. But uh, they're you know, there's us and then there's Switzerland and then there's everybody else in terms of, you know, the costs. And uh, so how did this come about? You know, why is it that uh, we are the only country in the world, in the developed world that is like this? Why are, why is it that the number of people who lost their homes, who went bankrupt, uh, who lost everything, uh, through bankruptcy and, 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 and had just had their lives wiped out. Uh, why is it that that number in the United States, because somebody got sick, is around a half a million a year. Uh, last year, around 700,000. This year, estimated to be a million because of COVID. And yet that number in Canada is zero or in Switzerland or Sweden or Norway or Denmark or Germany or France or Italy or Spain, zero. Why is it at zero all, in all those countries? And it's a million people here. So that's what I wanna dig into tonight, how we got here, how we can get out of here, you know, how, can, how can we fix this? And uh, what, you know, what's, what, what does it all mean? I, mean, there, I, I guess in summary. So I start out the book with the story of Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is a, uh, uh, you know, it's an independent nation. It's a smaller country than we are. It's 23 million people. We're 340 roughly. Um, so you would think, you know, if they were proportionate to us in terms of COVID cases that they'd have, uh, I, I don't do math in my head that fast, but roughly about what, eight, one eighth of the cases that we would have. Um, but Taiwan got their first case of COVID back in January of 2020, a year and a half ago one day after we did. Ours was January 20th, theirs was January 21st. We, over the course of the following year, 
uh, proceeded to have, you know, uh, well over 10 million cases. We had uh, over a half a million people die. Um, Taiwan had a few hundred cases and had uh, fewer than two dozen deaths. As of this moment, now Taiwan is now experiencing the Delta wave like we are, and so it's whacking them. And, but uh, as of this moment, uh, Taiwan has had 16,000 cases total in all this time and a total of 837 deaths. And we're over 600,000 deaths. We lead the world in, in deaths. What is unique about Taiwan, what make the, made the big difference is that they have what, what is arguably the cleanest single payer healthcare system in the world. It was, uh, it was put together from scratch. It was put into place within a year. Every single person in Taiwan at, you know, when they're born, basically, they're, they're given a, a card and a, and a number and then, you know, this is, here's your health records and they follow them throughout their lives. Uh, it's, a, it's a true single payer system. And because of that, within a week of their first diagnosis of COVID, uh, Taiwan was able to put into place a testing program and a contact tracing program that kept that island safe throughout that, the rest of that entire year. Um, be, so what that illustrates is that private health, personal health, and public health are, are really you know, two, two sides of the same coin. They're, they're very much related. And while in Taiwan, they were, they, you know, they took, and, and pretty much every other developed country in the world, they pretty much got it that, that our healthcare and our individual health are tied together. Here in the United States, we had you know idiots on TV going, uh, there's uh, illegal immigrants coming into the country and they're, they're carrying COVID and uh, we don't want them to have healthcare. These Democrats want them to have access to healthcare. And it's like, wait a minute, you, you don't want people with contagious diseases to have healthcare, but it, I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's just been insanity. So where did this come from? Why is it that healthcare is not a right in the United States? The story starts in a really fascinating place. It starts in the 1880s. In 1884, Germany under uh, Otto von Bismarck, uh, the German, um, uh, this is before the German Republic, this is the German empire, uh, got their first, got the world's first national single payer healthcare system. And Bismarck was no liberal. He was a hardcore militaristic conservative. And, uh, and he put it into place because it was the, in his mind, it was the thing that would guarantee the success of German industry, keep the populace healthy and do it at the lowest possible cost. It just made sense. And he uh, outspokenly defended it. Around that same time, a young man from Germany he, uh, got on a boat and came to the United States after he had been turned down by the German army. He was 17 years old. His name was Frederick Lud Ludwig Hoffman. He dropped the second N in Hoffman and um, slightly changed his name when he got here to the United States. Traveled around the country for a little while. He came here with like $5 in his pocket, uh, picking up jobs here and there. Um, but he was a, a, a math genius. He, was, he could do things with numbers that you know, nobody had seen in a long, long time. And it, within a decade or so, um, two big events had happened in Frederick Hoffman's life. Uh, one was that he had married a Southern belle from Georgia whose family had a long history with plantations and slave owning and stuff like that and had largely adopted their, her view, her family's view of race. And secondly, um, he, he got a job with the Prudential Insurance Company, which at that time was the largest insurance company in the country and basically did mostly life insurance. They had some fire insurance. This was before health insurance was a thing. Um, and in the process of running numbers on behalf of the, of the Prudential Company, Frederick Hoffman discovered that there was an association, a mathematical association between working in cotton mills and getting lung fibrosis smoking cigarettes and getting lung cancer. He, by the way, co-founded the American Lung Association. Being exposed to asbestos and getting mesothelioma, the, the unique type of cancer that, that, that actually killed my father um, that is the result of exposure to asbestos. And that there was an association, a clear association 
between eating a diet high in processed foods and a whole variety of cancers. And in fact, his book on diet and cancer is still in print in 2021. He died in 1946. So he was a famous guy and he was very well thought of. He had quite a reputation. Um, he was uh, uh, very well known in the 1890s, the 19 aughts, the 19 teens. And so in, the, in that decade of the 1890s, he decided uh, at his wife's suggestion to apply his mathematical skills. At this point, he was relatively famous for the work he had done on tobacco and, and uh, diet. He decided to apply his skills to race. Why is it, he wanted to know, or is it, that black people are dying more frequently or are getting sick more frequently than white people in the United States. And he researched this for a couple of years and ran all the numbers and wrote this 200 page book called Race Tendencies and Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro. It was published the same year that the Plessy versus Ferguson decision uh, establishing apartheid in the United States was, was uh, decided, 1896. And in that book, uh, Hoffman notes that black people are dying at higher rates, they're sicker at higher rates, and, and, and you know, which was statistically provable, um, but completely ignored all the environmental and circumstantial pieces of this, what today we would refer to as systemic racism, and instead came to the conclusion that uh, black people, African-Americans, were actually members of an inferior race, uh, which was not a radical idea in the 1890s. In fact, it was widespread among white people. And, uh, but then he made another logical leap in his book, Race Tendencies, or Race Traits. And that is that if we as a country, if the United States was simply to make it extremely difficult or even legally forbid black people from having access to health care because they were so genetically inferior, it would solve the race problem in America. Keep in mind, this is just you know, a generation after the failure of reconstruction. It would solve the race problem in America because they would all die out or such a large number of them would die out that you know, they would just become a marginalized people um, you know, like many of the Native Americans and you could put them on reservations and things. And he wrote about this at length in his book. He wrote pamphlets about this. He traveled around the country giving speeches on this. Um, he, in the 19 uh, teens, uh, Woodrow Wilson adopted his philosophy. In fact, Woodrow Wilson cited him, President, uh, Democratic President Wilson, um, and used some of his research as the basis for the eugenics program in the United States that was sterilizing uh, mentally retarded people, Native Americans and African Americans, among others and that was used by Hitler, that was cited by Hitler in the 1930s to justify his um, you know, Aryan supremacy program. And, and in the 1940s, his final solution is slaughter of Jews and gypsies and gay people, and, and, which started out, by the way, in Germany, largely um, with, in terms of death with people who were disabled or particularly mentally disabled. So, in the, during this period of time, in 1912, Teddy Roosevelt proposed a national health care system and the blowback against uh, President Roosevelt or then candidate Roosevelt um, was, but wait a minute, you don't want black people to have access to health care. I mean, that, that, that will be a bad thing for America. And Roosevelt had to largely abandon that effort. Then Franklin Roosevelt tried it in the 1930s, same response. Um, then Harry Truman tried it in 1947, uh, in fact, actually proposed a single payer system based on Germany's. And same response. Um, uh, this was a year after Hoffman had died, and yet people were still quoting Hoffman. He had testified before Congress. He was you know, friends with, with ma you know, major industrial figures. He was the, the head of numerous medical societies. Like I said, he started the American Lung Association. And uh, so that for 1947 and 1961, when John Kennedy proposed a single payer healthcare system, the video of that lives on YouTube. He comes right out and he says, you know, I'm not proposing socialized medicine like England, where the government owns the hospitals and employs the doctors, but rather we're proposing a single payer system where the government just pays the bills. It was the, you know, the precursor. It, 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 it was his 
laying down the marker for what uh, five, six years later became Medicare. And then in, in, the, in 66 or 67, whichever year it was Medicare or 65, whichever year Medicare was done, and forgive me for not remembering exactly. Um, again, this came back and these Dixiecrat senators, these white racist senators who were then Democrats, it was you know, Nixon's Southern strategy that flipped them all Republican in, in 68. Um, but this was three years, four years before that. Uh, they came, John Stennis and, and others uh, came to uh, Lyndon Johnson and said, we've got to keep, we got to, you know, uh, we're okay with you because the, the insurance companies were okay with Medicare because the government was going to take the responsibility for the most expensive patients, older people. Um, but the Southern Democrats were, the, the, Southern, the white Southern racists were like, you got to, we've got to figure out a way to do this so that poor black people won't be able to access it because we don't want them in our all white hospitals. And the all white AMA didn't want them there and uh, to be treating them in the all white doctor's offices. And uh, Johnson was frankly uh, very badly offended by this as were many people in his administration. But if he wanted to get it through Congress, he had to do this. And the, the compromise that they cut basically was that there would be a 20% copay on everything. And that was enough money you know, 20% of the cost of going to the hospital, 20% of the cost of going to a doctor, 20% uh, of the cost of an operation to discourage poor people, particularly poor black people who were facing other hurdles at, at the same time. Keep in mind at that time, apartheid, we were a legal apartheid state. Um, that was enough to satisfy them and LBJ was able to get Medicare passed. So that from basically from 1880 until 1980, for that 100 year period. The reason why America never embraced single payer healthcare, never embraced the idea that healthcare was a right, was nearly 100% because a whole lot of white people didn't want any black people to have access to it. It's really what it boiled down to, just pure racism. In 83, Ronald Reagan stopped enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act. And uh, which is the subject of my previous book, the hidden or two books ago, the hidden history of American Olig or of uh, excuse me of monopolies. And in that period from the '60s, well, really from the from the from the mid '50s in a big way until the mid 1980s, uh, health insurance became a big business, and there were literally hundreds of health insurance companies across the United States. Most of them were not for profit. I in the '70s, I, I ran a business in Michigan. We had a little factory with 18 people working for us. We, little herbal tea company. And uh, I, I remember, I mean, it was my company. I, I paid $35 per month per person for everyone's health insurance uh, through Blue Cross Blue Shield. At the time, there were three hospitals in Lansing, uh, Ingham Medical, which was the county hospital, Sparrow, which was, uh, uh, had been endowed by a former vice president of Oldsmobile back in the 20s. Uh, so it, it ran as a nonprofit that was fully funded. Uh, through its own endowment, and, uh, and St. Lawrence, which was owned by the Catholic Church. So they were all nonprofits. They were required by Michigan law to be nonprofits. And the largest health insurance company in the state was Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is also required by law to be a nonprofit. All that changed by the end of the Reagan presidency. So uh, we went from having relatively inexpensive insurance to having expensive insurance, and we went from having hundreds or you know, over 100 health insurance companies across the country to having really a, a small handful, uh, maybe a dozen of giant health insurance companies. And what happened was those health insurance companies were extraordinarily profitable. And, uh, you know, at this, by this point in time, we're not so interested in race, but they were interested in money. And what they knew was that with billions of dollars going through their fingers and, you know, 20, 25, 30, 35% profit margins, they were able to buy pretty much any politician they want. And they could launch any kind of PR campaign that they wanted to, to you know, convince people of pretty much anything that they wanted to convince them of. And so from 1980 to today, the reason why we haven't had healthcare as a right rather than a privilege, and the reason why we don't have any kind of all in national healthcare program has not been so much race, although that's still a piece of it. Uh, and that's why, you know, we have 12 former slaveholding states that still have not expanded Medicaid. They are still quoting 
Ludwig uh, Hoffman, Frederick Ludwig, Ludwig Hoffman. Um, but more importantly, it, it's money. It was the money and the fear of money, the political fear of the money of the healthcare industry coming down and crushing these, these people. So we've seen these kind of two phases of this, which leads us to the question, um, you know, where do we go with this? How, how, how do we get to, you know, a better place? Oh, before I get there, uh, I want to tell you just a quick story. This is just one of my favorite stories in the book. Um, I didn't know this again before I started the research. Um, Lyndon Johnson and, uh, and uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther, Reverend Dr. Martha Luther King Jr., got together when the, when the Medicare law was being written and after it was passed. And they had every hospital in America. They just sent out a form letter, and now King didn't do this, uh, but uh, I think it was Joe Califano, um, who was administering this program as head of HEW, um, sent out a letter to every hospital in the country saying, we're going to start sending you all this money. And it was a lot of money, by the way. By the end of the 1960s, Medicare payments were as much as 30, 40 percent of many hospitals' total revenue, huge amounts of money. We're going to start sending you money, but you've got to sign this paper saying that you will not discriminate racially. You will integrate your hospital. And, and at that point in time, pretty much every hospital in America was segregated. And, the, and the, in areas where hospitals did take in uh, people of color, particularly African-Americans, they typically put them in the basement or they had a shed out back. I mean, it was just like the treatment was, it was night and day. And so they all, the hospitals all thought, okay, it's just another bureaucratic form. And they just signed it. So then uh, Martin Luther King and LBJ got together. Well, in fact, let me back up the story even just one, one other step. Two days before the Medicare bill was signed, the AMA came to LBJ and the president of the American Medical Association and a ha handful of guys from the AMA. I mean, it was an all white organization at the time. And they did not like the requirement of uh, desegregation of the hospitals and of their practices. And they were also listening to people like Ronald Reagan, who had been warning that this was socialism. And so they came to the White House to, to basically tell LBJ that, you know, sorry, you know, your time is up. We're not going to go along with this and we're going to work against it. And uh, this, is, uh, this is from Joe Califano from the LBJ Presidential Library. Uh, uh, some notes that Joe Califano made from in his meeting, again, the secretary of HEW there. Um, I, and I'm, I'm gonna read it, it's very brief. Sitting around the cabinet table, the AMA officials waited politely for Johnson to say something as he settled into his chair. President took his time, gazing at their cold stares. Then he talked about the need for physicians in Vietnam to help serve the civilian population there. Would the AMA help? Could it get doctors to rotate in and out of Vietnam for a few months? He got the reply he expected. Of course, the AMA would start a program. Immediately, the doctors responded, almost in unison. Get a couple of reporters in here, Johnson yelled. The president, the reporters came into the room. The president described the AMA Vietnam medical program, heaping praise on the doctors present. But the reporters wanted to know about Medicare. Would the doctors support the Medicare program? Johnson looked at them indignantly. These men are going, to get, are going to get doctors to go to Vietnam where they could get killed. Medicare is the law of the land. Of course they'll support the law of the land. LBJ turned to Dr. James Apple, the AMA president. Tell him, you tell him. Dr. Apple told him. Two days later, LBJ signed the Medicare bill. I mean, just... It's amazing. So anyhow, uh, after this bill got signed, uh, Martin Luther King and, and, a, and, a, and a bunch of other people in the civil rights movement organized a program across America where black people would go to hospitals with uh, minor injuries or pretend injuries, um, you know, presenting like they had heart attacks or strokes or whatever, and uh, to see, you know, if they, if they would be admitted. 
And of course, most times they weren't, or they were put in the basement or whatever. And so they ratted them out, <laughs> to use the phrase that the AMA was using back then. They, they turned them in to HEW, and immediately the hospital got a letter saying, okay, you just got your last check. That's the end. Within one year, every hospital in America was fully integrated. Medicare was the most successful integration program in the history of the United States. And again, I, you know, I think most people have no idea about that and, or that LBJ and Martin Luther King worked together to make that happen. Um, it's, it's a hell of a story. So anyhow, how do we get there? Um, there's a, a couple of ways that countries have gotten to single payer healthcare or some variation on that. There's basically three kinds of programs. There's this hodgepodge, mishmash, poor profit, a uh, kludgy system with tens of millions of people who aren't covered and hundreds of uh, over 100 million people who are un, under covered. That's unique to the United States. There is a socialized medicine system, which is mostly pretty much the only major country in the world that has it is the United Kingdom, which is where the government actually owns the doctor's offices and the hospitals and, and pays the salaries of the physicians. They're, they're government employees. And that's true socialized medicine. And then there is single payer health care. Single payer is where there's just one organization that makes the payments, um, in this case, the government. And um, we have actually all three in the United States. We've got this crazy quilt one that we're all familiar with. We have a socialized medicine system in the United States. It works quite well. It's called the Veterans Administration Hospital System. And all the VA hospitals are owned by the government. All the VA doctors are employees of the government. And then, of course, we have a single payer system in the United States. Actually, we have two of them. One's called Medicare, the other's called Medicaid. So, you know, we have all of these things. And so there's a couple of different ways that countries get to this. Uh, the way Germany did in 1884 was basically by decree. <laughs> you know, the, Bismarck said, okay, this is it, we're gonna do it. Um, other countries have had other, and well, in the Taiwan story was fascinating. An American professor from Princeton went over to Taiwan and gave a a speech at a conference about how to create the best healthcare system. They had none at the time. And uh, he, got a, he got back to the United States. He got a phone call from, from one of the senior government officials who said, hey, would you come over here and design that system you told us about? He came over, he spent about six months laying the thing out and boom, they turned it on. And Taiwan to this day has the best single payer healthcare system in the country, in the world. Um, but I think the Canadian story is probably the closest to what may happen here in the United States in practical terms. And I say that because we're already starting to kind of back our way into it. We're already getting it. In Canada, what happened was uh, Tommy Douglas was a politician who worked his way up to being a member of uh, parliament, of the federal parliament. And there he was advocating strongly for a single payer healthcare system, never was able to get it passed, couldn't get past all the opposition. And so finally he said, okay, screw it. And he went back to Saskatchewan where he was from and ran for premier of that province. We would call it governor of the state and won. And as the premier, he convinced, and Saskatchewan's a fairly, fairly low population place. It's, you can do retail politics quite well. And Tommy Douglas was really good at it. Um, when I used to live in Vermont, uh, I, I remember somebody had told me once that Bernie Sanders had, had shaken the hand of everybody in Vermont at least three times, which is probably true. And the same was true of Tommy Douglas in Saskatchewan. And so uh, he got this single payer system into place in Saskatchewan. And within a year, the provinces nearby are going, whoa, this is cool. We want the same thing. It's cheaper. Everybody gets covered. Uh, you know, employers no longer have to, to, to either pay for individual health insurance or even pay for workman's compensation insurance. You know, if somebody gets injured on the job, government takes care of all of it. Um, you know, uh, it's just like, it's this magical thing. And within about a decade, as I recall the, the timelines in my book, um, all, every province in Canada had adopted their own and everyone is slightly different. The program in British Columbia is different from the program in Ontario. And they all provide, you know, a, a similar standard base standard of care that, that are largely identical, but some of them include eyeglasses and some don't, and some have a, a small copay for hearing aids and others don't and you know stuff like that tweaks around the edges so here in the united states the uh vermont peter peter shumlin was a member of the vermont senate back when louise and i lived in vermont uh years ago 
and he ran for governor on the platform of single payer. He was elected on that platform. Uh, the Democrats also controlled the House and Senate. And he got it passed and he signed it into law. And one of my very probably five best friends in the, in the world uh, was hired by him to be the guy, the HEW guy who was going to put this thing together. And uh, what my friend discovered very quickly was that in part because of the racial situation in the 1960s, because LBJ and Robert Ball, who wrote the wealth, who wrote the Medicare bill by and large, were concerned that states might take money, uh, particularly Medicaid money, uh, but also Medicare money, they might uh, mess with it basically to give it to white people and keep it from black people. And so there's this line of accountability between Washington DC source of money and individual consumer of healthcare that can't be broken. Um, even when it runs through states with block grants, there are all these accountability issues. And so what they discovered, and, and the same thing in California, California also passed legislation uh, you know, for single payer. Um, what they discovered was that if they flipped the state's single payer, no more Medicare money would come into the state and no more Medicaid money would come into the state. And this is billions and billions of dollars. So this has led to a movement uh, that has been going on for a number of years now to uh, produce what are called uh, Medicare and Medicaid state waivers. Uh, this has been introduced over and over again in the House of Representatives it's, uh, uh, and, and, and in the Senate uh, so that the, a state can go single payer and still take that Medicare and Medicaid money and add it into the money that the state has to raise for everybody else and have a functional single payer system. And my guess is that if we're gonna get single payer in the United States, it's probably gonna happen that way. And it's probably gonna start in Vermont and California and Oregon and you know, some of the reliably blue states that, and then other states like Canada will go, whoa, that's cool. We gotta have something like that. And, and so that, that state waiver thing, which sounds wonky, um, you know, it's like talking about the TRIPS waivers with regard to patent protections on vaccines. You know, uh, people talk about the TRIPS waivers will get the world vaccinated. Well, what the hell is a TRIPS waiver? People just don't know. Well, people don't know about these state waivers. So I want, I want you to know about it so you can tell other people and so you can encourage your, legislature, your federal legislators to, to, you know, carve that out, carve a hole in the Medicare and Medicaid so that that money can flow, flow through to the states. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, Pretty much, oh, and, and one other strategy that I, there's a couple of strategies to bring this about that I have in the book. And I also lay out, you know, Bernie and Elizabeth Warren's plan for how you do single payer and how do you pay for it? And, you know, there's all the bullet points and here's where the money comes from. And, and you know, it's all pretty straightforward stuff. Um, but there's one strategy that I've really never seen anywhere else. Uh, and probably somebody thought of it long before I did. I just don't know about that or didn't find it. But if you look at, see, the problem with going to a national single payer healthcare system, the immediate problem, is that you've got companies that are literally making billions of dollars in profits, not just revenue, profits every single quarter. So peeling off 400 million bucks to just drench Congress in money. Or, to, or, or peeling off a half a billion dollars to launch a nationwide ad campaign that would just carpet bomb the country with ads saying whatever the hell they wanted because the Supreme Court has basically allowed that and said that political free speech is the most, you know, lying in politics is totally legal. Uh, it's no big deal for these companies going up against these companies. And, and, and there's, I mean, there's huge money to be made here. Um, just one company, you know, United Healthcare. Their their CEO William J. William uh, McGuire, they, uh, the Wall Street Journal called him Dollar Bill McGuire, uh, walked away with 1.6 billion dollars. Now, you know, some of that, most, a lot of that was stock options, but still, you know, 1.6 billion dollars. He got busted. He had to give back 300 million <laughs> to avoid a fraud charge. Can you imagine if you robbed somebody of 300 million and still got to walk? Anyhow. Uh, he was succeeded by a guy, followed by a guy named Stephen J. Hemsley, who made over $700 million. And that's just the CEOs. 
I mean, these companies routinely pay their senior executives over a million dollars a year. There's huge money in this industry. So how do you take on an industry that has that kind of financial power? Well, I went through and added up their market capitalization. You know, how much are these, how much are these companies worth? If you, if you look at their stock, what would it cost to simply go out and buy all their stock? And it turns out United Healthcare is worth 235 billion, Anthem is worth 73 billion, CVS Health is worth 72 billion, Cigna 61 billion, Humanus 36 billion, and, and it goes down from there, you know, into tens of billions and hundreds of millions. You add it all up, and it's about 700 million, 700 billion dollars. You toss in the, you know, some of the other companies, the PPOs and HMOs, um, and the and the smaller players, and you know, at, at worst, you're in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars which is like, you know, the first nine months of Donald Trump's tax cut. So why don't we just buy them? Make their stockholders whole. You know, if you own stock in United Healthcare, hey, here's your money, no problem. And then with their employees, you're gonna import some of them into Medicare because you're gonna have to rapidly expand Medicare. And those who you don't need to import into Medicare, you can retrain or find other job opportunities or give them a year or two cushion or whatever. I mean, you know, we could make it, we could make it really sweet for these people. And it would produce such an increase in efficiency in the United States. There's a hospital in New York City that has about the same number of beds. My recollection is 529, but I, you know, it's, it's in the book someplace. Um, there's a hospital in New York City that's almost identical to a hospital in Toronto, about the same number of beds, about the same number of doctors, you know, pretty much the same number of procedures every year. The hospital in New York has an entire floor devoted to billing with, you know, dozens, maybe a hundred employees, you know, an, an entire floor that deals with insurance companies, that deals with the government, that deals with Medicare, that sends out demand letters to people who are late in their payments, that, that, that uh, works with lawyers who are going after people and putting them in collection, that deals with estates that have gone bankrupt because of their medical bills and they're trying to claim pennies on the dollar, an entire floor. Similar hospital in Toronto has one office with two desks and three people in it to do all the billing for the hospital. I mean, that's what we could have. So anyhow, that's, that's the book. Uh, that's my uh, uh, pitch on it, as it were, and pitch for single payer healthcare and, and how I think we can get there. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, uh, you can just toss them out to the town, town hall production people, put them in chat. I'd be glad to, to get into that. And, and uh, given that at the moment, I don't see any questions. Let me just see if there's anything in here that, uh, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think I've done a pretty good job of, uh, you know, we, uh, healthcare. Oh yeah, you know, the thing, this is interesting. The reason that England got their socialized medicine system that came out of this uh, meeting that, uh, that uh, uh, Stalin and Churchill and, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt had uh, was because Churchill thought it would fight fascism. It would, it would, it would, it would strengthen the country. It would be something that would be like, you know, a, a public good. I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, Ted Kennedy spent much of his life fighting to expand this. There's a whole thing in there. Uh, the uh, oh, the wanted Green New Deal. This is this is another one. This the. Um, uh, the Progressive Magazine just reprinted this particular chapter uh, as as a as a reprint, um, and and that was uh, you know you wanted one of the, one of the things that people who live in countries with universal tax. In fact, actually, let me just tell you a story rather than trying to read you something. I and this story is in the book. I was in Denmark back in two thousand eight. Uh, Louise and I went to Denmark to Copenhagen and, and uh, did my show, my radio show from there for a week and uh, had on a number of people. I, I love to have conservatives on my show and debate with them. So, you know, they loaned me a producer and I said, you know, get me some conservatives. And uh, so I had on uh, uh, one guy, Peter Morgensen, who I name in the book, who is the publisher of uh, rather conservative newspaper. I believe he was the publisher of the newspaper that published the 
the uh, cartoons that caused all the problems, but I could be wrong on that. But in any case, he, he's a, you know, a, a well-known guy. And I, I, I asked him, I said, you know, on the air, live on the air, I said, you know, how many people in Denmark go broke because somebody in their family got sick? And he was like, what? And I'm, and, and I'm like, no, how many people in Denmark go broke? How many, you know, lose their homes, uh, have to declare bankruptcy because somebody in their family got sick? And he starts blinking his eyes like he's like, huh? You know, like I'm a crazy person. And he says, well, well, none, of course. Why do you ask? And I said, because in America, it was a half million last year. And he's like, no, that can't be. I'm like, yeah, it's, that's, that's the way it is in the United States. He was genuinely horrified. So, in fact, I, I had started out our conversation by saying, this is, this is with another guy. This is with a, a conservative politician whose name I don't remember, I'm sorry. Um, and I said, oh, you're a conservative. You're one of the top conservative politicians uh, here in, in, uh, uh, in Denmark. Uh, so you must hate the single payer healthcare system, right? Conservatives all hate single payer healthcare. He was like, what are you nuts? It's the most efficient and least expensive way to provide healthcare. That's conservative. And so I thought I'd try another track, I, you know, because I was try, trying to bait the guy into a debate. And uh, Copenhagen had just converted a really good chunk of their streets into, uh, into bike only streets, no more cars. And so I said, well, you know, as a conservative, you must be really uh, opposed to this big government overreach, you know, forcing people to ride their bikes to work. And he's like, Are you, no, no, I, I, I love that. And I'm like, why? And he said, because my taxes will go down. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, our healthcare system is paid for with our taxes. And if more people ride their bikes to work every day, we're going to have fewer heart attacks and fewer strokes and healthier people and less obesity and less diabetes and all these other things. And what that means is less strain on our healthcare system, less expense for our healthcare system, and it will reduce my taxes. So I'm all in favor of it. And that's the thing that countries with single payer healthcare systems all around the world get. And one of the reasons why governments in countries with single payer health care systems kind of integrate their, their single payer health care systems with their public health care systems, like I started this whole riff with Taiwan, um, to have programs to fight obesity, to fight alcoholism, to fight tobacco addiction, to fight, um, you know, just a whole spectrum of things that you would view as uh, potential medical problems. And because they have a positive incentive system. Here in the United States, we have what's called a perverse incentive system as it's a, a phrase that economists use, perverse incentives. And um, you know, it's, it's basically that if somebody gets diagnosed with cancer, that's worth about a million dollars to the medical profession. You know, it, it's money goes up and, uh, and, and we don't see it in our taxes. We may ultimately see it in our in our uh, health insurance rates, but you know it just goes up. So, anyhow, though, that that uh, I, again, I think you know really illustrates uh, the situation. So, a couple of questions. Uh, number one, what's the political strategy in obtaining single payer health care? I think that you know these arguments just need to be made. I, I was really really pleased that um, Bernie was able to get to be as high profile as he was both in the 2016 and the 2020 Democratic primaries and, and kept his focus so singularly on this issue, which he continues to, to, to point to and to pound on. And, and Bernie actually was the guy who taught me, and this was probably 15 years ago. Uh, we started our show in Vermont in 2003 and in 2004, Bernie started coming on every Friday and taking listeners calls. And he did that for 11 years, every single Friday. And he was the one who told me that story. And he said, I think that if we get healthcare in the United States, single payer healthcare, it's probably best started in the States and administered by the States because that way you have kind of local control and that's the whole kind of Jeffersonian laboratories of democracy. Uh, different States get to see what works and what doesn't work and best practices can be developed and all that kind of thing. So I think the, the, the best political strategy is really to work on those waivers so that uh, you know, individual states can pass single payer legislation and get single payer health insurance. And then you know, within, certainly within a generation, probably in less than a decade as happened in Canada, it, it will go nationwide. Somebody else, else asked, how were you able to dig up the LBJ MLK uh, Junior Connection story? 
Um, the footnote is in my book. I, I read that in another, in somebody else's book. And in fact, I, you know, I, and I should credit them. This, this is, okay, yeah, this is in the book, The Triumph and Tragedy of Lyndon Johnson, The White House Years by uh, Joseph Califano. In fact, what I read to you was a direct quote from that book, uh, the, tragedy, the Triumph and Tragedy of Lyndon Johnson. It, it's kind of, you know, uh, Joe Califano's bio of uh, LBJ. Uh, uh, last question here. Given your knowledge of the realities and challenges, how likely do you think a single payer system in the United States is and when? Oh, this is you know, probably the final point that I make in the book. In fact, it's the last chapter of the book, um, you know, playing off Rahm Emanuel's um, uh, retelling of the famous old cliche, you know, never let a, crisis, a good crisis go to waste. And that is that I would have um, conservatives on my radio show a decade ago who would yell and scream about Democrats want to give uh, free health care to, to illegal immigrants. And I would say to them, but, you know, if that person is sitting next to you on the bus, don't you want them healthy rather than coughing TB on you or something? And, and it always kind of stopped them in their tracks, but, but I was never quite able to convince them of it. And it was always on this kind of onesie twosie basis because they were still reciting this stuff on TV on, on all the networks. I mean, this was just, you know, Democrats want to get, in fact, they, it's still a slur uh, against Democrats. Hey, they want to give illegals health care. You know, I don't want to pay for some illegal health care. Well, COVID, in my opinion, changed everything. It, it woke us the hell up to the fact that individual health care and public health are, you can't un, untangle them. They, they, are, they are part and parcel of each other. And so I think that uh, the best political strategy right now to get there, whether it's to use this to pass the waivers or whether it's to use this to pass a single payer system or even to use this to simply amend Obamacare uh, to add the public option, which Joe Lieberman killed after he took over a million dollars from the health insurance industry. He was the vote that killed it. Um, of course, he represented Connecticut. I mean, they, they were his biggest funders or among them. Uh, but, you know, there's a variety of ways to get there. But I think that the, the biggest lever that we can use, the, the Archimedes style lever that, you know, where we can push and we can move, a, move the planet is to point out that uh, we have a public health emergency and we've got families all over the, all across the country, uh, people in their 20s and 30s who thought they were healthy, don't have health insurance, didn't figure they'd ever need it. And now they've got, you know, I mean, just a day in the ICU is 100,000 bucks. They're looking at million dollar hospital bills that are wiping them out. And uh, isn't it time to put a stop to this insanity and get a system that works for all? So thank you again for having me here and I'll toss it back to Weir. I think. Or Olivia. Thank you. Oh, Olivia. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Um, really, really fantastic presentation. Um, really appreciate your insight. Um, and thank you everyone who submitted questions this evening. Um, and once again, don't forget to pick up the book. We do have a link from Elliot Bay to pick up the book from them. They're a wonderful supporter of what we do um, and we love to support them back. So once again, thank you so much, Tom Hartman, for being with us this evening and have a great night, everybody. My pleasure. Thank you.